Good afternoon. My name is Allison Kaplan. I'm director of education at the National First Ladies Library at the National First Ladies site in Canton, Ohio. We want to thank everyone for attending today's installment of Teacher Talk, a quarterly program for educators presented by the National First Ladies Library. The National First Ladies Library and the National Park Service partners offer virtual and hopefully in the next school year in person opportunities for educators and students. We'll post links to those in the chat, which we encourage you to use to say hello, let us know where you're from and what group of or age group of students you teach, what subjects you teach, um, as well as offering any questions you have for today's speakers. We'll also be sharing a link to a survey that will allow you an opportunity to win a copy of the First Ladies of the United States catalog for the National Portrait Gallery exhibition. I also want to mention to you that today is Dolly Madison's birthday. The hostess with the mostess was born 253 years ago today. And as your host today, I want to mention a few additional housekeeping items. The Education Center at the National First Ladies Historic Site in Canton is currently open to the public and features three really amazing exhibitions. Defining Her Role, The First Lady's First 100 Days, Ivy Wed, The Marriage and Influence of Ida and William McKinley, and So Chic, The Life of Anne Lowe. In addition, the National First Ladies Library hosts several virtual programs from lectures and film discussions to book clubs and cooking demonstrations. To find out more about those, go to the National First Ladies Library website at firstladies.org or find us on Facebook. The National First Ladies Library was extremely enthusiastic to loan artifacts and provide research for Every Eye is Upon Me, the First Ladies of the United States, which will be on view through the weekend at the National Portrait Gallery in Washington, DC. If you are interested in learning more about the exhibition beyond today's program, um, you can actually visit the National First Ladies Library YouTube page for a talk by the exhibition's curator, Gwendolyn Dubois Shaw. And that is an amazing talk. Be sure to check it out if you want more information. As teachers, we are often driven to have our students read as much as possible, looking to biographies and primary sources when it comes to historical figures. But we rarely have our students slow down to look at portraits and pictures. I'm super excited to turn things over to today's special guest, Jocelyn Coe, the Student Programs Coordinator at the Smithsonian National Portrait Gallery, and Nicole Vance, Gallery Educator at the Smithsonian National Portrait Gallery for today's program. Thank you so much for leading today's session, and I will turn things over to you. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Allison. Well, as Allison said, my name is Jocelyn and my colleague Nicole are so glad to be here with you from the National Portrait Gallery. I wanna begin our time together as we do with all of our programs, and that is with a land acknowledgement. Native peoples have made their homes and communities throughout what is now the United States for a very long time and still live here today. We are grateful to be on these lands at the museum or in our homes or schools and really excited to share this time with you. Well, if I could get a quick yes or no in the chat box, if you've ever been to the National Portrait Gallery in Washington, DC, or maybe brought a group of students to visit, that'd be great to, to see. Oh, I'm seeing some yeses. Excellent. Yes. <laughs> oh, good. Well, I'm so glad um, some of you have had a chance to visit and hopefully one day everyone will have a chance to come. Um, this year, as with everyone, we've had to pivot to the virtual world and we've been so pleased to share and provide resources 
to schools and teachers like you when we normally would not have been able to pre-pandemic. So I just wanted to provide a bit of a roadmap for where we're headed today. Um, I'll give a broad overview of the museum and the exhibition, and Nicole will be doing a demonstration of how we do a close look at one of our portraits with students. And then I'll have us take a peek at our birthday portrait. Um, and then we'll walk you through the Smithsonian Learning Lab platform that we'll be using and provide some additional resources and then call it a day. So um, as I get ready to share my screen, just wanna throw out the question, what is a portrait to you? If you could put in the chat box, how would you define a portrait? Right, well, Rebecca is kicking us off uh, by saying uh, a portrait is a painting or artwork of someone important. Um, Allison's in agreement saying, you know, a representation of a person. Ah, Laura, I like this reflection of character um, and Sharon uh, mentioning, you know, an inner self being put on campus. All right, those are wonderful um, ways to define and look at portraiture, definitely. Um, portraits session essentially is the likeness of the person. Um, so here we are at the National Portrait Gallery. This is the exterior of the building. Um, it is the third oldest federal building in Washington, DC. It was the home of the Patent Office for a while before it became a museum. And um, should you come and visit, you would come on into our wonderful courtyard, which is quite vast. It's about half the size of a football field. So the museum's mission is to basically tell the story of the United States by portraying the individuals who have uh, made a difference in the nation's history, development, and culture. And as you know, with any story, the story of the United States is ever changing, ever fluid with characters coming and going. And in this case, with the exhibition, Every Eye is Upon Me, the museum is bringing light to the stories of our first ladies that have not been widely made known. The exhibition is the first major exhibition to explore the historical significance of this position through the mode of portraiture. Um, and it spans 250 years from Martha Washington's portrait all the way through to Melania Trump's uh, portrait. There are about 60 portraits plus a few iconic dresses. And um, as Allison said, it's on view just a few more days um, and the museum recently reopened last week. So if by chance you're coming to Washington DC this weekend, come, come and see it. Otherwise um, we do have it online and we'll be sure to put a link to the online exhibition. Um, before we dive into the portrait, just wanted to share with you um, how we look at portraiture with students in terms of um, what we call them elements or clues to look for in a portrait. Um, as I mentioned, a portrait tells a story. And so we ask the students to keep in mind 10 clues or 10 elements. Um, we ask them to look for facial expression and pose both of which can give a sense of what the sitter, the person in the portrait um, is, uh, what, what type of uh, message that sitter may be sending. Clothing and hairstyle give a historical context that helps um, shape the story. Setting, whether it's indoor, outdoor, wherever the sitter is also um, reveals some more about the story behind the sitter. Objects are a fun one for students to be looking for in terms of things in the portrait that relate to the sitter. Color, 
sets the tone and medium we talk about with the kids a lot in terms of what material has been used to create the portrait um, from 2D to 3D to even video or we call them time-based media and scale how large or small a portrait is really gives that sense of the sitter and finally, the artistic style. Every artist has their own way of um, portraying a sitter and that comes through as well. So with all these clues and elements, um, we then uh, head over to the portraits um, to have students explore them. And I will stop sharing my screen. So I'll have Nicole, um, kick us off with the first portrait. All right, well, thanks, Josh, Jocelyn. And um, I, I thought we would start with uh, one of the most kind of iconic portraits, at least of a first ladies from the National Portrait Gallery's collection with this recent portrait of First Lady Michelle Obama. Um, and before we get into kind of the, the biography of the sitter um, and kind of the background behind this portrait, I'd like to kind of model and um, I work through this portrait with you through one of the visible thinking routines that we use at the National Portrait Gallery. Um, as Jocelyn mentioned, we often use the elements of portrayal to read portraits just like we would a text. Um, so if you're looking for ways to incorporate portraiture in the classroom, a great way to do that is to um, think about these as you know primary documents, as you know, a visual um, record of the past. Um, and today, we'll be using the uh, visible thinking routine claim support question. Um, so if you've used visible thinking routines in your classroom before, um, you know that this is a great way for students to really map their thinking um, and to also, you know, find um, a kind of evidence in either the story that they're reading, the, the artwork that they're looking at, or even a kind of song they might be listening to. Um, so for claim support question, this thinking routine, it really kind of reflects how we often think as, as humans, um, first by um, making a claim. Uh, so with a claim, that's really kind of an interpretation or an idea about the artwork. After the claim is stated, um, you'll then um, have your students kind of share their uh, supports and um, how they um, have come to that conclusion and um, what evidence do they see in the portrait. Um, and then finally, kind of a, a question, kind of the third part to this thinking routine. Um, what, what questions are left unanswered um, or perhaps even what wonder wonders do you have about the portrait? Um, so I'll, I'll model one of these um, uh, claim support questions. And as, as I'm modeling this, I'd like for you to kind of think about how you might um, apply this thinking routine. So for example, um, starting with the claim, um, when I look at this portrait, I see a very strong, courageous, and a very balanced woman or first lady in this portrait. Um, and then for the support, um, I see that she is sitting and she's sitting tall. Um, her body and her dress make a, a triangular kind of composition um, that kind of tells me that she appears very balanced, very strong, has a very solid foundation. Um, and then finally, kind of the, the question, what, what needs to be um, answered? Um, and so for that, I might connect the dress. Uh, so how might Michelle Obama's dress that she's wearing in this portrait, how might that also support these ideas of strength and, and, and balance in the portrait? So I'd invite you now to take a few moments to really carefully and closely look um, at this portrait, let your eyes brush up and down the canvas um, from top to bottom and side to side on every corner. And I'd invite you to write your own claim, support, and question in the chat. Um, or if it's easier for you to, to raise a virtual hand um, and share out with your, your voice, um, that is all right as well. To help you kind of closely look at this portrait, I'm going to zoom in from top to bottom so you have the opportunity to see it a bit more closely.
All right, and zoom back out to the entire portrait. Oh, Nicole, we've got um, a response with geometric monochrome with splashes of color. Yes. Oh, I, I love that comment. Yeah, uh, many students are, are drawn to kind of these shapes and colors um, in, in Michelle Obama's dress. Excellent. Oh, and then I have, um, she's a modern woman by the looks of her dress. Right. Oh, thank you so much, Marion, for that that comment. Yeah, that um, I can that claim that she's a modern woman, and then I'm um, supporting that with the dress that Michelle Obama is wearing. And Joanna says that I feel she looks sad. Okay. Oh, Joanna, that's a that's an excellent claim. And um, I may ask you a follow up question. What do you see that supports the fact that she looks sad in the portrait? Perhaps as Joanna's writing, oh, there it is. Okay, she says it's her eyes and her mouth. Yeah. And then we're getting some more comments. Um, Barbara says dignified, confident, grounded. Um, Rebecca says the blue background makes everything feel calm. Um, Allison says she seems stand, standoffish. She's protecting herself because of her pose and the way her dress covers her lower body. Um, Max says she looks sad because she's not showing her beautiful teeth. Um, Jennifer says she sees sadness too with a blue tone. Um, Paulette mentions her gaze is direct and challenging. Um, Cindy says she looks reflective, perhaps proud and confident of the role she played. And Joanna says First Lady Obama is in the beautiful dress, but um, to me, she has the weight of the world on her shoulders. Hey, oh, these are all wonderful interpretations and ideas about this portrait. And I love how you're looking to a lot of those elements of portrayal that Jocelyn mentioned earlier, such as her pose, facial expression, and the clothing, even those colors in the background, that blue, how it feels so, so calming. Because when I see that there's a few more coming through in the chat. Yes. Um, let me see here. Uh, Susan says she looks a bit vacant. Um, it's not really to her liking. Um, she has far more personality than this. Um, it's strange that she never wore anything like this. Um, usually see her in tailored, sleek um, clothing. And Sharon asks, where's her dancing eyes? <laughs> So this, this portrait is a little puzzling, right? It, it doesn't look mm -hmm. how maybe we might imagine Michelle Obama to look, or it doesn't maybe match up with other, other portraits or other representations that we've seen of the former first lady. Lois says it doesn't do justice to her beautiful arms. Yes, yeah, she does <laughs> have very toned arms. Hmm. All right, so these are again wonderful kind of claims and supports. I'm um, now moving on to kind of the the question part of this thinking routine. Um, based off of your your claims or your interpretations of this artwork and the supports that you use to kind of back up that claim, um, what kind of questions remain unanswered in this portrait for you? Oh, and I see Barbara has already um, added some questions in the chat about how the sitter, how Michelle Obama felt about this portrait and if it met her approval. I will definitely oh, yeah. get into that in a moment. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's right. Oh, 
Um, Paulette asked, why isn't there a sense of place? She seems suspended somewhere, somehow. Um, Allison's curious about how the artist addressed um, uh, the skin color. And Susan says, my guess is she, since she chose the artist, she has to say she loves it. <laughs> Yes. Oh, these are excellent questions. Um, and I like how you're, you're looking again to those elements of portrayal. I'm um, thinking about the background and uh, uh, earlier we talked about the blue as a sense of calm, um, but really it doesn't give us any sense of, of place or time, which we often find within the backgrounds or settings of portraits. And um, also in terms of those, the colors used, yeah, Michelle Obama's skin tone in this portrait is, is not at all how it is um, in, in reality. And um, so there are a lot of questions to explore further. Um, let's see. And then um, I do see Rebecca's comment in the chat about her, her dress, the way it's, uh, way, the way it's styled. Um, and it doesn't necessarily look like a real dress that, that someone would wear. Um, Rebecca, I'd, uh, I'd like to mention that the dress is actually within our exhibition of Every Eye Upon Me. So this is a real dress that Michelle Obama had in her closet, but I definitely agree with you. It, uh, it looks so much uh, different than other, other things that she's worn. All right, so uh, this claim support question thinking routine is, is really wonderful to use with students to um, get them to look closely at the object or the portrait, whatever whatever you're having a conversation about um, and, and find kind of that support for their interpretation for their idea. And then also to kind of open up the box in terms of, of questions that they, they have um, and to really lead kind of the conversation in a direction that the the students um would 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 like to see um oh and i, I think there's a few more that have popped in <laughs> there have yes and actually um let's see marie was asking why did the artist want her to pose this special way um and allison oh is asking what age group would you use this routine with yeah, no, that's an excellent question. My apologies for not mentioning that earlier. Um, so claim support question, um, it generally look, works really well with a, uh, grades four, fourth grade and above. Um, but you can also modify this um, thinking routine with younger students as well. Um, I asking them, you know, questions about the artwork and then what they see that supports that and then any other further questions that they might have. Um, so Again, kind of thinking about all of these, these questions that you have about this portrait, um, I'd like to address um, uh, the ones that I do know the answers to. Um, and I might back up and give a little bit more information on how this portrait came to the National Portrait Gallery. Um, so for the last um, 20 or so years, the National Portrait Gallery has commissioned portraits of the um, former president and first lady. Um, so the curators at the National Portrait Gallery, they present the former president and first lady with a list of names of artists, kind of like a portfolio of artists that they think would be a good fit for um, the president and first lady. Um, they then review kind of those, those candidates, um, often have an interview of sorts. It's, it's very important that the artist and the sitter have a, um, a good relationship, that they enjoy each other company and um, I if if they do not that's oftentimes really reflected in the portraits we have one of Lyndon B Johnson where he did not get along with this portrait artist and he hated his portrait <laughs> um, but luckily I um, I Michelle Obama she she chose um, uh, an artist that um, they, they both really, really got along well with. Um, she chose the artist Amy Sherald. I would also note that Amy Sherald was on the list of artists uh, who um, potentially could paint Barack Obama's portrait. Um, and Barack Obama met with Amy Sherald and Amy Sherald told him, you know, um, I, I would really appreciate the opportunity to paint you, but I would much rather paint your wife. Um, and luckily Amy Sherald was selected by Michelle Obama to paint this official portrait especially um, because of Amy Sherald's distinctive um, style. Um, Amy Sherald paints all of her sitters with a grayscale skin tone. Um, and Michelle Obama really, really loved that. Um, uh, 
that quality of Amy Sher Sherald's work. Um, Amy Sherald kind of points to her um, experience um, attending museums as a young girl and um, recognizing that the only time she saw herself reflected in portraiture as a young African-American woman was, was through photography. Um, and so by painting all of her, her sitters with this grayscale skin tone, kind of, uh, uh, reflecting that, that, that past or that history. Um, in terms of kind of the, the questions earlier about the um, uh, background, we don't have the sense of space. This is also something that's very typical of Amy Sherald's style. Um, she'll usually have a, um, a solid background. Um, and she chose this, this blue, it's actually painted over a layer of red. Um, but even though it's a blue color, it still kind of has a sense of warmth and depth. Um, I do have some um, images of the um, uh, sitting and the process. So um, I'll kind of show you um, uh, Michelle Obama here. She is um, seated in a garden um, in the dress that you see her pictured um, uh, in on the right. Um, and and uh, Amy Sherald, she, she works from photographs. Um, so she invited Michelle Obama for the sitting. Um, she chose what Michelle Obama would, would wear from a variety of dresses from the stylist and then posed her in this position. And I wanna ask you all, um, thinking to this pose, um, what, what types of feelings does it invoke? Or maybe how might you think Michelle Obama might be feeling based on the pose in this portrait? Oh, and I do see some, some questions about um, if she's she's barefoot or wearing sandals. Mm -hmm. I actually don't know the answer to that question. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. uh, Rebecca says, I think her pose is strong, pushing against tradition traditional, traditionally more feminine poses. Um, Paula says reflective. Um, Cindy says she's serious and strong. Yeah, oh, these are all wonderful, wonderful ideas. Yeah, and um, it's really what Amy Sherald wanted this um, pose, pose to convey a lot of these ideas that you have of, of strength, reflection, um, serious, strong, focused, powerful. Um, and as Sharon just mentioned, you know, grace and elegance. We see all of those here within this portrait um, uh, in, in this pose. All right, so thinking back to the dress, I know there were some, some questions about um, why this dress. Uh, this is not typically how we might think Michelle Obama might dress in this, in this portrait. Um, and the dress is very, very important to, to this portrait. Um, I, it was a dress that Amy Sherrill picked out that was in Michelle Obama's kind of closet, um, uh, or one selected by uh, Michelle Obama's uh, designer. Um, and it was chosen because the patterns reminded Amy Sherrill, the artist, of another type of art form. Um, so I'm, I'm curious what your thoughts are. Um, what does this dress remind you of? All right, Susan says a bit of African batik. Okay, yeah, no, it's an excellent connection. Oh, and Paulette says elements of quilting or flags. Rebecca says abstract art. <laughs> yes, oh, and I, I think definitely a combination of all, all of these things. Um, I even thinking to European artists, as um, uh, Allison mentioned, um, and mm -hmm. Pete Mondrian as well, um, uh, are kind of nods to uh, Michelle Obama's African heritage. And um, you're you're all right. All of these um, ideas are coming together to form this um, Millie label dress that Michelle Obama is wearing. Um, uh, so a lot of these geometric shapes are not only um, borrowing from um, modern art, but especially borrowing from um, quilting, um, specifically um, the quilts of um, uh, Jews Bend in Alabama, which were 
created by and continue to be created by a community of African American women. Um, and Amy Sherald, she really loved the connection between um, uh, the, the patterns of this dress, kind of invoking um, these, these quilts. I have one here. Um, for you to see. So you can see the, the, the triangles and, and rectangles, kind of these repetitions and patterns um, uh, really um, uh, resonated with Amy Sherald. And, and by wearing this dress, Michelle Obama is um, uh, nodding to you know, the, the generations of, of African American women that preceded her and kind of connecting her to her heritage in this portrait. Um, so a really um, wonderful um, kind of tie in to art history, um, specifically African American art history. Let's see, and are there any other notes? Scott, that have? Yes, a couple more comments have come through. Sharon says it's unique, not choosing between black and white or color, but both. Um, Marie says, I think she's possibly thinking of how many things she could be doing like all women do, think that the dress is so flowing, she can be herself. Um, oh, definitely. Um, I wanna show you the um, dress. If you were to um, come to our museum before this weekend <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and see in person, but um, we do have um, the dress. You can see some of the, the similarities there. Um, uh, Michelle Smith, the designer of this dress, I'm, uh, I kind of use um, uh, kind of common common fabrics um, here in this portrait uh, or in this um, dress. And uh, so this is a dress that is kind of access accessible <laughs> um, uh, to kind of the, the general public in a sense, as opposed to maybe other other designers. Um, uh, you can see kind of the um, uh, the ties between these two. Mm. And Mary does says it seems like the dress is more important than the portrait. <laughs> oh, that's a, that's a really, really wonderful insight. Um, this dress is really, or this dress and this um, portrait, they're really wonderful to use with younger students, especially in identifying shapes. Um, uh, not only the shapes in Michelle Obama's dress, but also thinking about composition and uh, Michelle Obama's dress and her body even making this triangular form. Um, I, if you teach younger students, another great um, approach to this work is uh, called strike a pose. Um, with this, you have your younger students and um, I form their bodies into the same pose as the sitter of the portrait, and then talk about um, kind of those, those questions about how the sitter might be feeling um, and, and why that's important. All right. Well, in the interest of time, we have um, another portrait to show you, as well as um, uh, many more resources to use with your with your students or um, for your for your own education. Um, I, but before we um, I, I move on to our next portrait, are there any other questions um, that you have about this portrait? How to use this portrait with students? Be happy to answer. Um, Allison asks, when does it go on tour? Oh, I wish it went on tour. <laughs> <laughs> so this exhibition is, is not going on tour. However, this portrait um, will be going on tour um, uh, starting um, next month. Um, its first stop is at the um, Art Institute of Chicago along with Barack Obama's official portrait. Um, and then I, I believe the Art Institute is probably the closest location to where many of you are located in Ohio. Um, they'll then move to the Brooklyn Museum, um, the High Museum um, in Atlanta, um, uh, museum in Los Angeles and then Texas. Um, oh, and in terms of if Michelle Obama likes the portrait, um, I, yes, I, I, I believe so from interviews that I've, I've heard um, and at the unveiling when uh, Michelle Obama, Barack Obama and everyone saw this portrait as well as her husband's at the same time uh, seemed to have a very, very pleasant reaction. Um, I do know that Barack Obama loved this portrait. Um, he couldn't keep his eyes off the portrait uh, when, when he was at the museum. All right. 
Oh, yes. Oh, and Cindy, definitely. It's a very interactive and um, memorable experience for students, especially if um, you're still teaching students um, virtually. Um, it's a great way to um, really get them um, uh, interacting with the work. All right, so with that, um, let's let's celebrate um, Dolly Madison's birthday. <laughs> yes, thanks, Nicole. And um, we, I wanted us to take a look at um, the portrait, given what we just saw with Michelle Obama's portrait. Let me pull it up. Oops. Here we go. Um, and quick question for you. If you could put in the chat box, how is this portrait different from Michelle Obama's as a first, as portraits of first ladies? How is this one different? All right, Allison's noticing that she's definitely a lot older in this portrait. Um, Rebecca's yes. in agreement, um, thinking about phases of life. This is um, I kind of at the end. Um, Joanna mentions um, the, the clothing um, that Dolly Madison's wearing in this portrait reveals a lot more about her era. Mm, definitely, yes. So um, we are seeing her at a different time period in her life. Um, this portrait was done um, within the last decade um, of her life. And um, just curious how you can tell, um, how you could tell that she, she was older based on this portrait. All right, and Justin, as those responses are coming in, um, oh, okay. I had two Jennifers that had really wonderful uh, differences that they notice. Um, in this okay. portrait of Dolly Madison, it's not the full body. Um, we just have kind of a, a bust. Um, there's a, a different color palette on um, warm colors. It's very per personable and approachable on um, uh, demeanor that we see in this portrait. Oh, wonderful. All right. Yes, um, a lot was shared there. So yes, we do have Dolly Madison um, shown with this color contrast um, with the red, bright red shawl and the darker um, inside clothing and the lace around her neck. Um, Dolly Madison apparently would wear bright contrasting colors um, to bring attention to herself. She was quite social. Um, she really set the standard for first ladies at the time. Um, she was considered um, the hostess with the mostess um, with how she was able to um, be able to make connections and relationships. And so um, we, we see Dolly Madison here with a turban um, that was rather common. She was Quaker and so uh, given that uh, sense of piety, she always had a, a head covering. Um, in terms of um, her hair, they are, um, it is a wig that she's wearing. Um, it's not her own natural hair, um, given the time period of the painting. Um, just want to zoom in a little bit. We have a, a look at her face and her facial expression um, and then to her gaze. And you might be able to um, see that her eyes are a bit cloudy and that um, gives a sense and recognizes that she did have cataracts later in life. Um, and so Dolly Madison is known for a lot of things, but with portraiture, um, we are especially um, uh, interested in how she had um, in 1814, um, when the British um, stormed the capital, she um, had enough foresight to rescue um, the portrait of George Washington um, entitled Lansdowne. Um, she knew that that was quite important and how uh, portraiture like that uh, could have been um, 
a really a, a, a PR um, mess uh, during that time. And so um, she's known for rescuing the Lansdowne portrait. Um, and we have her here in this uh, image, in this portrait. Um, it was done by um, an artist entitled William Elwell. And um, we have it in our collection and is part of the exhibition. So we have our um, Dolly Madison, our birthday portrait here. And with that, I'm going to um, stop oh, sharing. There were a few questions in the chat, um, okay. Jocelyn. Um, sure. a, a, lot of, a lot of participants were noticing kind of the round composition um, and how you can see kind of those, those brush strokes around the edges. Um, some maybe thinking it might be unfinished or if it was covered with a frame. Um, uh, and then a lot of a, a lot of participants are also noticing kind of the, the earrings as well uh, oh, and, yes. uh, and how they're kind of crisp and clear compared to kind of the, the rest of the painting. So I really appreciate yes. how everyone's looking so closely. <laughs> yes, definitely. Um, and I believe it. I'm not quite sure that the painting was um, created and I think made for um, to be given to the Madison family. Um, and uh, I know the artist, um, there's a quote from his diary about Dolly Madison being a very esteemable lady, kind and obliging, one of the old school. Um, so a little bit more about her and how um, Elwell saw her. All right, well, with that, I'll have Nicole, share some of our learning lab um, tips and resources. <laughs> All right. Um, so with the last two portraits that um, we've explored, um, uh, these are found on what's called the Smithsonian Learning Lab. Um, so this is a Smithsonian-wide resource that's free. Anyone can use it. Um, and uh, create an account to create their own collections. Um, uh, but this collection that we've been focusing in on um, is related directly to um, our um, exhibition of First Ladies, Every Eye is Upon Me. Um, so this is a, a great resource to use with um, your students in the classroom um, in terms of introducing them to not only the National Portrait Gallery, but as well as um, some kind of key words um, in regards to portraiture, such as, you know, portrait artists that are symbol as well as those elements of portrayal, and then has um, all of the portraits and objects found um, in the exhibition. And with all of these portraits, um, you have um, the chance to really kind of zoom in and um, uh, look at them um, uh, more, more closely. Um, as you notice with Michelle Obama's portrait, um, I uh, there's a lot of uh, resources that can be, be paper clipped um, to um, understand the portraits. Uh, and so it's, again, kind of a great, great resource, especially in um, object-based teaching. Um, in addition to that, this specific Learning Lab collection um, features kind of worksheets and activities that you can use with your students um, that utilize creative writing. So we have um, a letter writing kind of exercise or kind of a conversation on creative writing prompts, art activities. Um, today, I know we've talked a lot about the importance of clothing. Um, so your students can have the opportunity to, you know, really design their own clothing for for, for a first lady, as well as kind of creating their own portraits. Um, in addition, there's um, videos with other um, art projects that um, you can use with your students that relate back to first ladies. Um, uh, this one right here focuses in on um, presidential kind of campaign funds, but uh, remixes it in a new way to um, create um, pins for, for first ladies. Um, and again, these are using kind of materials that are kind of 
um, available to, to most teachers. Um, so really um, a great, great resource um, uh, to use. Um, and then finally, um, this specific collection has many um, books um, uh, that can be utilized in the classroom as well as other um, uh, resources for educators. Earlier, Allison mentioned um, a curator talk. The link is found in here. You can um, watch it within the Learning Lab um, collection as well as other um, videos um, relating back to the exhibition. Um, in addition to um, our our website as well. Um, uh, so if you are, <laughs> if you're maybe not, not an educator or you don't have students of your own, um, this is also another wonderful resource um, I, in kind of looking at all of these portraits from what maybe more scholarly view. Um, uh, the great thing about this exhibition is, you know, although it's ending shortly, um, it will live on um, online. And um, there's many, many high resolution images um, that you can use um, to you know, explore, explore um, the role of a first lady in the United States. Um, but moving back to the Learning Lab collection, um, and I'll, I'll drop this link in the chat. This is the um, page specifically for the National Portrait Gallery. Um, so this is where you'll find all of the Learning Lab collections um, created by NPG educators that you can use in your classroom. Um, so if you are looking to um, feature um, uh, voices during Heritage and History Month, um, you can use these collections to kind of explore um, I've had people from history, um, as well as collections geared specifically to early learners, um, uh, focusing in on maybe one or two sitters. Um, there's a lot of wonderful, wonderful resources here that you can use with your students. Um, and again, it's it's free. It's a wonderful resource to use, and you can have the opportunity to kind of save um, resources that um, you like or specific portraits, and kind of build your own kind of online learning lab collection or online exhibition um, that your students can access. Um, and with that, um, I, Jocelyn will um, I take you through other ways to use the portrait gallery in your classroom. Thanks, Nicole. And I just dropped um, a couple links as well to um, to what I'll be referencing. Um, we have lots of classroom resources on our website. Um, it's the teachers and students um, site. And just to show you, we offer um, Summer Teacher Institute this year. It's virtual, as well as teacher workshops um and uh student programs which is uh also virtual and um let me i'll go to that page next but also you can look for classroom resources and even some recorded webinars um and then just want to zero in on student programs um because that is what nicole and i do we um do offer virtual uh, school groups, virtual visits for um, school groups. We are wrapping up this year, but we definitely will be offering virtual programs um, through the calendar year starting in um, October of the fall. So you can start thinking about perhaps having your, your students visit virtually uh, next fall. And um, finally, in terms of classroom resources, we um, work with Google Arts and Culture. So there's lots of, whoops, lots of wonderful um, resources through Google Arts and Culture, as well as the Learning Lab that Nicole just explained. And then we have recorded um, videos on YouTube of previous programs, um, lectures, curator talks, and, um, all sorts of good stuff. And let me stop sharing. With that, I know we've thrown out a lot of information. <laughs> <laughs> Just want to leave a little bit of time for any questions that you may have um, regarding the portrait gallery or the exhibition in general.
Jocelyn and Nicole, I have a few quick questions I hope you would be willing to answer that kind of relate to National First Lady's site. But have you ever used some of these techniques with like campaign buttons or dresses where maybe there's an image of a person that's really small or the person isn't present? Do you have any recommendations for those types of objects and do you think of them as portraits? Jocelyn, would you like to answer that one or would you rather I? <laughs> um, well, uh, in, we could both answer it. Um, just kind of off the top of my head, um, in terms of, you mentioned buttons, um, we do have um, in our uh, social justice uh, exhibition, we have a portrait of Dolores Huerta, Cesar Chavez, and then buttons um, from the United Farm Workers um, grape, uh, Delano grape strike. And so we incorporate those buttons um, into our discussions about um, the figures as well as the portraits. Um, so we can do it in, in combination. Definitely if, if, um, if it's something that uh, represents um, a figure, I say it, it's worth, worth uh, including and mentioning. What do you think, Nicole? Yeah, oh, definitely. I think um, anything that can relate back to um, an individual's biography is definitely important to understanding, um, you know, other portraits. So you could use, um, maybe if you don't have a, a portrait, maybe within your, your collection, or if you're learning about maybe campaign um, buttons and pins, maybe kind of contrast that to a portrait. Um, I, I was really kind of great conversations that can be had, um, not only comparing and contrasting portraits, but portraits with, with objects um, in that regard. So one, last, one final follow-up for me. Um, I was also curious about like a portrait as a primary source and feelings that you have. I know teachers use a lot of primary sources or sometimes use picture books in the classroom. And I was wondering, um, have you used them in tandem ever before or? Um, it yeah, so picture books and portraits mm -hmm. together. Yeah, definitely with our, our younger audiences. Um, we have some programs where we specifically will re read a, um, a children's book and then look at a portrait at our museum. Um, and just portraits in and of themselves are kind of a great primary source document. Um, uh, the portrait gallery and uh, uh, the portraits that are, are collected are, are um, uh, oftentimes the artist has has seen the sitter, um, whether they, they were there in person kind of photographing them or painting them. So it is um, uh, kind of a historical document in a sense. Um, I, so yeah, kind of portraits are a great way to um, explore history. And I think it's also a great um, equalizer in a sense. Um, you know, most students can share what they see in a portrait um, and everyone can kind of talk about um, how, what that connects to what they what they already know. And Jocelyn, I don't know if you have anything else you want to add? <laughs> Just to add an example, um, the, uh, you know, the wonderful Michelle Obama portrait inspired the children's book, Parker Looks Up. Um, and so that, I think that that book is also in the Learning Lab collection um, as part of the, uh, the exhibition. But um, again, great segue um, to, to talk about portraiture. I believe we, we even had a school group who requested a program because they had read uh, the children's book first. Well, Jocelyn and Nicole, I don't see any additional questions. I just see a lot of people thanking you for your time today and this program. It was really informative and super helpful. So thank you so much. I am going to compile all the links and information that you shared with us today and send them out in an email along with the recording of today's program to anyone who attended. I know there may be people watching after the fact um, or who didn't catch the whole thing. Someone is off on their anniversary dinner. So um, I wanna make sure that they get that information, but thank you so much for joining us today. This was really wonderful and 
if I can't visit the National Portrait Gallery, I'm happy to connect with you virtually and have this experience. It's been amazing. Thank you. We really enjoyed being here with you as well. Thank and thanks you. everyone for your comments in the chat. <laughs> yes, thank you. So with that, we're gonna wrap up the school year for our teacher talk program. And um, I am going to, again, um, throw the link to our evaluation um, information in the um, chat so that you can have a chance to win a book. And we will also be sending you out an email in August that has all the information about upcoming programs in the fall, whether they're virtual or in person. So thank you so much for joining us today, everyone. And um, we hope to see you again in the fall. Thanks.